Thank you so much, Jamila. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to host such an uh, amazing uh, set of panelists today. Uh, each one extremely accomplished uh, in the areas that they have been working on for the last multiple years. Uh, I think I was just counting. I think between the panelists, there's more than hundred years of experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's it's really a, a pleasure uh, to host uh, each one of you. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, we have, uh, I'll start with a small icebreaker session where I go around uh, this group and ask them uh, some informal questions to start with. And then we can discuss the actual topic that we are getting uh, getting to today. Uh, so uh, Mune, I will start with you. Uh, you had a very interesting career and, and I saw that you started as a research scientist in Australia's National Science Agency uh, you went on to uh, become the chief technology officer at Avaya. And in the last nine years, you've been leading most of the product marketing on the cloud side for VMware, looking at security, looking at edge computing. Uh, can there be more buzzwords in your resume? Uh, so what is... <laughs> so, so, so Mune, what is... Can you just describe how it was, uh, you know, your journey from... Uh, the university days to research to uh, being the CTO of Avaya and now you know almost leading the cutting edge of technology in one of the leading software firms in the world. Thanks, Sudant, and thanks for the first pleasure being here, and thanks for that kind of putting me in an awkward spot straight away. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know that's all panels are about. Um, no, it has been an interesting journey, and I think what has always been uh, kept me moving is uh, curiosity. So I'm very curious and an innovation. So I think uh, the first one of you know CSIRO, if you actually look up, then um, I was part of the the you know the innovation and the filing of the patent called Wireless LAN. So if you look up the history of Wireless LAN, that was actually invented out of uh, our labs in in CSIRO back in the late '90s. So I was part of that group. So that was. You know, today the usage of wireless is so uh, prolific that, you know, that was the innovation for, for me. The second part, evolution from there to Avaya was, again, innovation, curiosity to early, very early days of unified communications and contacts and all of that blending together. And um, that was early days as how do we kind of, how challenging is it to kind of bring that to market? Um, spent a long time kind of doing that. And then the last nine and a half years at VMware, I was uh, tasked when I joined VMware to create something for VMware beyond the hypervisor vSphere. So I was part of the team which, you know, coined and took to market software defined data center. And then I established all our partnerships with folks like, you know, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Google for multi-cloud. And as of this year, again, innovation, I believe that as all of us have started working from home remotely, the next push is workloads, activities moving towards the edge. So uh, as employees first move to the edge, now, you know, everything, the workloads and applications are moving to the edge. So that's kind of the next frontier for innovation and curiosity. So I'm always driven by that. So enjoyed the journey. Great. Thank you, Munay, and uh, pleasure to have you on the panel. Really look forward to your thoughts on today. Uh, Claudia, um, you, you spent more than 20 years in the tech business, right? And uh, all the names that we would ever aspire to uh, be associated with, you've been there and done that, right? You've been with Amazon, you've been with Microsoft, you've been with Motorola, you've been with Oracle, and now you're with Facebook. Oh, I need to catch my breath. <laughs> so, Claudia, and right now you're doing something very exciting, right? Uh, you're looking at uh, the Facebook Reality Labs as the head of future of work partnerships. That sounds pretty exciting and uh, in, uh, very pertinent to what we are going to discuss today. But before that, uh, what do you think has been the most exciting part of this uh, really uh, wonderful career journey that you've had? Yeah, so first of all, thanks for having me. I'm really um, excited uh, to be part of this panel and, and this discussion because it is so relevant to what's going on today in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, I have been involved with um, some pretty amazing technologies and brands. And I, I sort of uh, always sought to find myself in roles in my career in technology where I was working with products that were helping people improve their lives. And so, yes, you mentioned you know, I was involved uh, with the original Palm Pilot, which is one you didn't mention. I actually launched the Palm Pilot um, outside of the United States as one of my oh. first roles in technology. Um, I was at Motorola when we launched the Motorola Razor. 
um, Amazon with the Kindle e-reader, I could go on and on. I guess I've been very uh, lucky to be part of these incredible uh, technologies um, innovation. But I think, frankly, where I find myself today is probably the most exciting time in my career. Um, you know, I don't think anyone could have predicted how the, you know, a pandemic and how it would affect us in working. And uh, as before the pandemic, I was working on partnerships for um, Portal, which is a device that is designed for video calling um, for consumers to bring people closer together, even when they're far apart. And when the pandemic happened and we all found ourselves working from home, um, you know, as Facebook employs thousands and thousands of people trying to remain productive and collaborative and connected, it was very difficult to do. We didn't really have the tools at home necessarily to, to stay connected. And Portal became essential um, as a work tool. And our company, Facebook, enabled all of our employees to have one at home and we're using it. Now, in fact, I'm speaking to you on a portal. We, my team um, worked to bring all of the leading video calling technologies. Uh, we have many representatives here from the technologies that we support, um, BlueJeans, Zoom, um, uh, Cisco WebEx, and as of yesterday, even Microsoft Teams, which I'm very proud to announce. <laughs> um, so uh, <laughs> it really has become an essential work tool. And I, for me, this is really the best place to be at this time is to try and help solve these very complex problems as we're dealing with, uh, you know, remote work, hybrid work, um, and all of these new use cases that we didn't know about two years ago. Excellent, Claudia. Great to have you on the panel and good work with timing the team's partnership. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have had something to say about it. <laughs> Great. Uh, perfect. Coming to you, Dave. Uh, Dave, you were almost the first employee of Microsoft in, in Canada. You're one of the very few people on this planet who can say that they were closely associated with Bill. Um, you've gone on to experiment with your own venture. Uh, you've gone on to, you know, interesting career options like interior lifestyle network, et cetera. You've come back to Microsoft and are now heading, uh, which is, uh, you know, definitely one of the fastest growing businesses that they have, and that is Teams. And that's why I mentioned what I did to Claudia. So, uh, <laughs> so this interesting 30 year journey that you had, a uh, oh, uh, very diverse one, and we are glad to have you here. Uh, what has been your biggest motivation? And if you could share uh, some of uh, maybe one exciting anecdote from this journey, that will be really good. Okay, absolutely. A pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, like Claudia and Monet before, um, I have been blessed to be able to participate in some of these breakthroughs that have changed our lives. Like Monet, I'm driven by curiosity and really uh, a drive to help this technology, as Claudia said, to make lives better. Um, what got me to into computing in the first place was an accident. And that was, I had very narrow sinus cavities and I wanted to be like Jacques Cousteau and scuba dive and dive with the whales. And I learned uh, with narrow sinus cavities, I'd be signing up for either a desk job or a life of extreme pain. And so I switched my major to computer science. And at the University of Manitoba, I saw them working with um, technology to help people with temporary or permanent disabilities. And I thought, wait a minute, these computers aren't just going to be better calculators, faster calculators, they're going to change people's lives. And that got me hooked from the beginning. And that still has me hooked today. And I remember when COVID hit, how we were getting phone calls on the team's engineering team from around the world saying, we need you to light up a million students in our country this week. Um, and then the next call, we need you to light up 2 million students in our country this week. When I joined Teams Engineering, we were around 10 million worldwide users. We're over 250 million now. So wow. a quarter billion people came on, the, on, and we went from one to two billion minutes of meetings every month to 11 billion a day. Um, it was just a crazy ride. Um, so from the early days of technology to now, the opportunity has been to surf the wave that's come up. Sometimes you can see it coming. Sometimes it hits you from behind and you just better get on that board and catch that wave before it goes. Um, but at the root of it all, the passion, the thing that gets me out of bed in the morning is helping customers and helping people leverage this technology. And, and I'll give you a quick little personal example. And this actually is going to be a nod to Claudia. 
um, because the portal was the device that let us communicate with my mother-in-law up in Canada. She's in her mid eighties and she was finding even an iPad too complex to work. And so we needed to find a device that would not have us looking at this part of her face, the whole call, because she would hold it too close uh, and would also let her have one touch join. And that was the last thing she had to do for that call. And the portal was the one we ended up using for that call. So grateful that you're now supporting teams and really grateful for the ability it gave us to communicate with my mother-in-law uh, back up in Canada since we couldn't get up to see her now for two years. So technology is continuing to change lives and it's a joy to be here with you all. Thank you, Dave. What an amazing uh, story and, and, and uh, career that you had. And thank you for sharing that with us. We look forward to more such insights going forward. Uh, Mahabaleshwar, uh, great to have you here. Uh, you you've been you have had a diverse career. Uh, you started off with Pace, looking at the research part of it, doing the engineering, uh, right from the setup box to video streaming. You experimented and dabbled with your own startup. You went to B school. Now you're uh, you know one of the uh, key players from the product management perspective of Blue Jeans. Uh, how what do you would you say would be you know the top two learnings that you would like to share? Um, with us today. Hey, uh, thanks, Siddhant. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of this esteemed panel today. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, coming back to the question, uh, the learnings that I would like to share. Um, first thing that comes to my mind is um, user. User is uh, the core of anything we do uh, as uh, like a founder of a startup or a product manager building the products. So it's important for us to keep users at the core of uh, our business, uh, think about who they are, what their needs are, how can we address those. Some of the examples quoted uh, today in the discussion is about the user, like mother-in-law, right? Like the user, their needs, how do we solve the problem and so on. So it's, it's very important for us as founder of a startup or like as a product manager to be focusing on the user. Uh, interestingly, that's also relevant for the topic we're gonna to be discussing today. Um, as people responsible for, say, workplace strategy, it's important for us to focus on our uh, employees, uh, their needs, what they're looking for, how it has evolved, and devise a strategy uh, to address those. So that, that's the first uh, learning, like uh, importance of focusing on user that comes to my mind. And the second one, uh, if I have to uh, quote, is about uh, re reinventing yourself at every step of your uh, career. Uh, again, uh, uh, if I have to share an anecdote, uh, as a founder of a startup, we started off to solve a problem and we very soon realized that people were not willing to pay for that solution. And we had to change the course, use the uh, money that we had raised and build a different product altogether for the same user base. So basically reinventing ourselves in the mid course to kind of uh, solve problems uh, for our customers. That's not just true uh, as a founder of a startup, but also as a product manager. Like uh, Again, to quote an example, a uh, recent example of uh, days pre-COVID where the video meetings platforms were built to focus around office experience, like in-office experience. All the innovations were happening uh, to satisfy the needs of the people within the office. Um, work from home was not like a major use case, but as soon as this massive experimentation happened uh, all over the world, like people started working from home, our innovation shifted from in office, in meeting room experience to in home experience, be it like coming up with a new uh, devices just for in, in uh, a home meeting experience or the desktop experience. So it's it's reinventing yourself in the business as an individual. And that's also very much relevant for, uh, again, the topic uh, that we're gonna be discussing today. As people responsible for this uh, workplace strategy, how can we kind of focus on what is important and how we can adopt the new technologies that are coming up in the marketplace to solve problems for our employees. Great, great. Thank you. That was very insightful, uh, Mahabaleshwar. I'll call you MB uh, going forward. Um, That's fine. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Frederick, you, you've been, uh, you know, for about two decades, you've been looking, you've been working with Amadeus. We all know Amadeus to be, uh, you know, the world's premier 
a travel uh, enabling company uh, you've started out by working on their product but uh, most interestingly you actually moved to you know helping them connect the teams their digital workplace solutions even before the pandemic uh, did you ever imagine what would have happened in the last one and a half two years i'm sure you didn't but just talk to us a little bit on uh, you know what has been the most exciting part of this journey uh, maybe some interesting um uh, experiences especially in the last couple of years thanks sidan uh, so very pleased to be part of uh, this panelist um perhaps i'm going to sound a little bit cliche but to me the the um, what stick me if i can say that to uh, to amadeus is people actually being surrounded by by so many talented people that are daily reinventing transforming a whole industry actually is is super exciting Uh, and at the same time it's also the enriching aspect of the journey um being confronted with all these people all these different uh, um this diversity not only nationality gender and so on but really this diversity helped me to be uh, um to have more humility to be more humble to uh, uh, have more empathy and to understand that there is not only one way to to change things and that it's by mixing all these different view by mixing all these different aspects that you are starting to have a team which is really a game changer so actually your question was funny on whether uh, yeah. we were seeing the 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 pandemic coming or, or the the work from home coming but actually just before the the, the pandemic beginning of uh, of february uh, we were explaining our vision to our executive committee and the vision was working from anywhere and, and uh, it was mainly a vision uh, uh, to help us in our day to day life and to help our employee and in, in their day to day life um and then one month after <laughs> we have been said okay guys in one week from now you need to have 20,000 people working from home so do whatever is needed and uh, but we have to do it and and the team and, and again we are talking about people uh, the team that uh, i have the the um, uh, the honor to to lead actually they they were mind blowing they they just did it uh, organizing by themselves uh and in one week they managed to have everybody on board which helped dramatically uh the um, the business side and helped our customer to ensure you know th this was the time all these flights were disrupted the 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 airlines needed to reschedule people to move them from one uh, uh plane to another one and thanks to all these uh, people helping uh, the airlines uh, uh working from home i mean things were a little bit better so to me if i can summarize it's people and i think that in in what we are talking today the main point is people it's it's probably not where you are working the location whatever it's people in the end great great thank you fred i think uh, i look forward to hearing more such war stories uh, as we proceed uh, thank you very much great so i'll now move on to uh, where we ask uh, some more pertinent more uh, my questions which are more oriented towards the topic today uh i'll maybe start with dave uh, dave as we uh, as we seen you know companies have adopted different methods and we just discussed a few of them uh, across this panel round uh, you know virtual workspaces uh, co-working spaces etc uh, where do you think the future of work uh, is heading or how do you see it evolving dave Uh, so Rishi, you have been at uh, Harman for uh, you know more than seven years. Overall, you've been you had a very great stint across different technology firms, etc. Uh, you led different tech engagements uh, across areas and different types of customers. Um, would you like to share with us what are the some of the learnings that you've had across these years, which will help you and Harman you know shape the future of digital and digital working going forward? Sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me on on on, on this panel list, uh, and thanks, Dave, for uh, you know reminding Siddhant that uh, he has missed me. Uh, you know, yeah. So this is uh, this is very much uh, relevant in uh, these times, basically, right? Uh, so the change in technology, as uh, Dave also pointed out, is is inevitable. 
you know it is happening at a faster rate these days you can you can all see that you know every quarter you see uh, all the tech companies are launching newer products newer version of their existing products right so you know people need to be curious and look out for a better solution how we can we can uh, change the life of uh, uh, you know the users who are using those, those products you know so that's the first learning you know i i can remember like you know when we were developing the first vr solution for one of the uh, you know uh, service provider in us uh, you know uh, at that moment you know we were using cardboard and 4k uh, you know uh, uh, cameras basically jitter and latency was the main issue at uh, five years back you know so uh, we were not able to get that project kicked off but now uh, you know if you look into it with edge and a uh, lot of uh, uh, you know cloud related uh, enhancements which has been done in the technological areas basically you know we we are building similar kind of solution for uh, you know uh, people in uh, with, with, who are living with autism and uh, you know similar kind of uh, things basically right so uh, i would say like staying put uh, with, with the, uh, uh, the efforts and remaining focused would help uh, you know anyone and everyone uh, to to excel in this uh, specific area we started with uh you know web first kind of application models then we moved on to mobile first uh and then cloud first came into picture to to optimize the capex and uh, other things basically now we are talking about flexible first right which is creating cloud enabled solutions which are driven by collaboration tools like teams or uh, you know others uh, you know so that will help put everything together and see multiple uh, uh, applications which are being used in enterprise environment by uh, our employees basically uh, you know in a more efficient manner and that that would uh, drive a lot of productivity improvements and uh, intelligent automation low code no code kind of platforms like power apps or app sheets you know those will be the things basically which would be hand of the citizen developers to bring about transformation business transformation in coming coming months and coming years i would say another another aspect related to the learning is build diversified teams basically you know once you once you do that you know you'll see innovation kicking in into your your products and your mindset basically right and that will drive a lot of uh, business outcomes which will help uh, it, uh, you know uh, uh, which will help the industry to be relevant and uh, uh, you know, organization to be at the forefront, basically. So these are the few learnings. We practice all these aspects in Harman DTS to transform lives. And, uh, you know, those those similar kind of uh, learnings can be imbibed across the board by different organization to, you know, excel. Great. Uh, thank you, Rishi. Uh, look forward to hearing about uh, more of such uh, interesting ways as to how you've been helping customers across the board as we move forward. Uh, yes, back to you, Dave. Uh, future of uh, work, how do you see it evolving? Yes, absolutely. And um, I, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, we've done some work with Harman with some customers to help them adjust to this new future of work and uh, with a large global airline. Um, so we ended up having to help them plan to deploy planes in new ways and communicate around the, the flight and everything that was going on there. We did some great innovative work together. And so the key became not just people on site in an office, but even which people are at an airport. And can I all of a sudden bring in people from another airport to help support a flight? Because we're working in some cases with reduced staffing, et cetera. So as we look at new technologies, we're breaking it down in all areas, technology in the home, technology at the office. Uh, pretty staggering, a stat that I saw recently that um, surprised me, and I live in technology every day. We think about meeting rooms, and there are apparently, according to a company called Frost & Sullivan, 90 million meeting rooms worldwide. 7.8% of them have video. Only 7.8% Today, I mean, that's staggering. And yet we here we are, we're all on video. We're all coming in from homes, from offices, from different places, from around the globe. We actually don't know where each person is and you can't tell by an accent even where that person is. Um, so it's, it's becoming a way for us to enable technology. It used to be prohibitive to do so. You'd have to spend 100,000, 200,000 or more to outfit a room. And now for the cost of a PC, you can outfit a room with video, audio, sound, 
around and these are special devices. I don't mean just bringing your PC into the room. I mean a collaboration bar, a Teams room device um, that lets you have great camera, great sound and an inclusive experience. So what we're seeing is the world has gone hybrid. It will stay hybrid. And what we need to do is accommodate people in these different hybrid work environments, whether it's some people in, some people out. Used to be the person outside of the room was at an incredible disadvantage. After the last two years, they were now recognized almost as an equal in that, in that meeting space. And how do we make sure we don't go back and lose that? and keep everybody engaged in the meeting and keep everybody participating and everybody able to see everything and collaborate together. So we're seeing a lot of innovation around work and the flow of work before the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting. So we're bringing in apps into the meeting space, right into the meeting canvas, um, et cetera. It's, it's fascinating to watch this evolve. And uh, we'll talk more about that as we go forward today. But I, I just wanted to point out that when we often think, oh, we have video, well, 7.8%, that means over 90% don't. And so we've got some work to do to really improve things for everybody to be equal in this new hybrid work environment. Great, excellent, Dave. Uh, you're making it harder for us to get back to office. <laughs> <laughs> or, or better for you, so you can go when you want to. <laughs> true, 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 Dave, absolutely. Uh, Claudia, from your experience uh, and, and uh, from how you are looking at things, where do you see the future taking us? Yes, yeah, so first of all, I completely agree with Dave, and I think we all agree that, um, that this new normal is a hybrid model. We're never going back to the old normal whatever, you know, it's like, it's really passed behind us and we need to focus on the future. That's incredibly clear. Um, I also agree with Dave. I think it's really interesting to see the dynamics now in terms of how people are working. Um, and, and people to me are at the center of really the problems that we need to solve. So even with what Fred was saying, like, it's all about people. Um, and I'll touch on that in a moment, but, um, you know, at Facebook, we obviously were very well equipped with video conferencing and lots of conference rooms around the world. And recently we allowed some employees to go back to the office. And I had a colleague who went back to the office to attend a meeting with 50 people and 49 were at home and one was in the office. And he actually went to the office, plugged in, connected to the video conference and then decided five minutes later to drive home because he had better tools at home on his, you know, whatever he was using, whether portal or the laptop, to be able to join and interact and communicate during this very large, very important meeting than he did in a conference room. So we really have to think about the fact that there is a new way of working and that we need to balance how we provide people the right tools. And I think at, at FRL, we think about it in terms of what we say is a sense of presence. I think that's the key in terms of putting people at the center of the experience. Um, you know, in, in virtual reality, I've talked a lot about portal In virtual reality, it's, it's, you know, we have a technology to be able to put you remotely into a collaborative environment. The immersive experience is there today. The challenge really is how you can make that experience more authentic and more, you know, genuine where you truly, as you put your virtual reality headset on and you join a meeting, how are you feeling like you're sitting next to the person you're talking to? Are you interacting with them in that genuine, authentic way? Is that a rewarding experience or does it make you tired? After one hour that you have the headset on and you're in a meeting, are you feeling exhausted? Um, because, you know, it's not, it doesn't feel natural to you. So I think the key here is to think about the fact that it's not just enough to enable the infrastructure and the tools. It's really important to think about that experience, that user experience that brings this new level of collaboration and communication and supports this new normal, this hybrid way of working, mm -hmm. and maybe even does better than the way it was before. I think that's the key. Great, thank you so much, uh, Claudia, for that. Uh, moving on to uh, to my next question, and uh, I think I'd, uh, I'll, I'll try and pick uh, MB's um, brains for this one. Um, so on the technology side, uh, MB, what are the kind of different, um, uh, you know, strategies uh, and technologies that you seem to be adopting to uh, make this workplace, like like Claudia and Dave said, the hybrid, new hybrid workspace, a lot more collaborative and um, safe, 
um, and and also more welcoming for these for the employees. Yeah, uh, a great question. So uh, I completely agree with what the Dave and Claudia said uh, about uh, everything being hybrid going forward. Uh, companies are not anyway going back to the old model of being in office for uh, their work. So so hi- hybrid is the new normal. But one thing to note here is not all the companies are the same. Uh, every company has different strategies around what their hybrid uh, definition looks like. Um, so uh, t- talking about the strategies that we have seen being being in the video conferencing industry that gives us like a unique perspective on how people are uh, actually adopting technology, using technology to solve their problems. Uh, I would like to look at it in like uh, in, in three ways. One, uh, from device standpoint, uh, as uh, Claudia was talking about, portal type of devices that uh, people have come up with. That's an innovation as a result of different way of uh, working that people have adopted, right? Like, so based on the needs of the users, like the device manufacturers are coming up with the different types of devices to solve uh, the problem. That's around the device. So as a company uh, that is looking to kind of uh, better the experience for their employees are carefully designing their strategies around what type of devices to uh, provide to their uh, employees and what kind of uh, management and security are needed around those devices for personal use or for the office use. The next thing that comes to my mind is network and connectivity. It's very much important. Just the device is not enough, but how do you kind of connect to a stable, reliable network um, is very much important for a video meeting to be successful or for any type of collaboration to be successful. So the strategy around the network uh, and the partners they choose to go with. And the last thing that comes to my mind is uh, companies have also carefully uh, uh, chosen apps or the tools for uh, these needs. When I say apps and tools, say for example, it could be uh, tools for their video meeting, um, tools that are secured, uh, as you said, feels inclusive. It's kind of uh, providing equitable participation for people at home, in the office, or on the mode maybe on their mobile devices, right? So uh, not just that, the last and most important thing is uh, uh, tools that have highest accessibility standards as well, because now you have to operate or uh, access the devices and the tools to kind of engage with your uh, peers uh, or subordinates in the office. And it's important so that we take everyone uh, along with us through uh, practicing highest accessibility standards that uh, we do here at BlueJeans uh, today. So th- these right. are the things that uh, some of our customers have adopted uh, that we have seen uh, during the hybrid uh, environment. Great. Thank you so much, MB. Uh, Rishi, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, the audience to benefit from your uh, experience of working with different types of customers and helping them in different ways and forms. Uh, what are the different technologies and strategies that you have seen uh, some of your customers deploying and becoming a lot more prevalent? And where do you see this going? Uh, great question. So, you know, there are, uh, I'll, I'll say three main uh, strategies basically, which we see like, uh, you know, organization are following, which is revolving around people, which is revolving around processes, which, which are being followed in the enterprise and, you know, uh, definitely the places, you know, when I, when I talk about people, right, employee first kind of uh, strategies are being talked about. Uh, they are in main focus. Earlier, we were uh, looking, you know, customer relationship management related platforms. Now we are talking about employee experience management related platforms, which are being launched basically, right? That are more focused towards how we can manage our workforce better, how we can, you know, enhance the experience, uh, you know, which which our employees are getting basically uh, staying with the organization. How we can improve the talent, uh, which is which is which is there within the within the organization, right? How we can train them better, train them faster, basically, you know, so that uh, you know uh, uh, the, the 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 gap which is going to be there in the talent pool, basically. Uh, you know, as per one study, which is which is there, forty-one percent of the current fo- workforce would would transition basically, right? So, how we are going to build up that uh, gap, which would be there basically, right, is is what uh, uh, you know companies are focusing. Uh, human capital management related solutions are getting a lot of investment. Be it creating simple applications to manage the vaccination record related uh, things, basically, or you know, applicant tracking systems, you know, which which will help to bridge the 
or identify the right kind of uh, 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 you know talent basically which is required for the organization you know those those kind of uh, 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 platforms are getting a lot of uh, focus and investment from the customer this is one of the uh, thing which we are seeing safety of the employees is another important aspect basically right and uh, how you are going to make your uh, environment safe when this hybrid culture will uh, or model will kick in you know, so a lot of companies are focusing on that so that, you know, the, the social distancing, distancing aspect, which needs to be taken care of, can be, uh, you know, implemented. Harman has uh, uh, developed some of the solutions, you know, which are which are uh, pretty helpful for the enterprise environments. Aquilar is, is one of similar kind of a solution which will help uh, organization to keep their, uh, you know, employees safe in the uh, office environment. Second aspect, which is related, is is processes. You know how we we are going to improve the processes. Basically, how we are going to uh, you know make the information available to the employees uh, in a more efficient manner. You know that is another aspect uh, which is which is getting a lot of focus. You know the frontline workers, which are remote, uh, are not connected. You know uh, at least uh, seventy percent of the uh, workforce which is there, which is remote, which is uh, you know, dealing with the front lines uh, are, are not connected with the enterprise systems, right? So if we connect them, you know, this will definitely help the bottom lines, basically, of the organizations. You know, that is what is getting huge focus, basically, right? One of the uh, instances which uh, uh, Dave was talking about for, for an airline organization or an airline customer which we served recently is, is uh, related to that. We connected the front line workers with the team space solution which helped uh, improve the productivity and customer satisfaction. Uh, that is one of the example which I wanted to quote. Uh, you know, then another uh, a process related aspect is lot of lot of stuff is not uh, digitized currently, right? So if we digitize and uh, you know do things which will help to improve the uh, productivity, improve the timelines basically with which that process can be completed. Will, will help uh, uh, the enterprise and uh, customers basically uh, a lot. Last but not, not the least, the places, you know, so companies are looking at building uh, hoteling kind of uh, solutions basically so that, you know, once this hybrid uh, model kick, kicks in, uh, not everyone would be coming, they will not be having a fixed seat allocated anymore. So how we can uh, make that experience, uh, you know, workable for the employees so that they can book the, uh, uh, you know, office space for the day, which they will be going into the office and connecting it with, the, you know, IOTs and uh, IOT sensors and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, digital twins related uh, stuff, basically, or maps, basically indoor maps, you know, which, which, which can be integrated will help organization to plan things better and Further, you know, going forward, you know, these things can be integrated with the uh, facility management system so that, you know, the the, uh, the staff can sanitize those those areas and, uh, you know, solutions like these will be coming into picture and we clearly see a lot of investment coming into um, uh, in, in, into the reality, basically, for, for these kind of solutions, uh, you know, that's what uh, I just wanted. Right, right. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rishi. I mean, that, those are very different and uh, interesting anecdotes that you provided. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Fred, uh, you, you spoke about, uh, you know, your, your work on, uh, you know, helping get all your employees on a digital um, workplace model. Uh, I think for... Uh, just just to imagine the kind of scale of investment that would be needed for that uh, i think it's it's uh, it's very hard for normal folks to imagine so i want to look at one of the interesting questions for you right so when you talk about these you know deploying these digital workplace solutions uh, what kind of technologies um, uh, are you seeing that the companies are investing in uh, it could be new technologies <laughs> or some old ones which uh, seem to be a lot more robust just talk us through some of that tech landscape in uh, in implementing these digital workplace solutions so oh, good question uh, i think there are even multiple level uh, to this question i think the the, the first one is covering the basics, covering the foundation, ensuring that people can connect seamlessly, easily, all together. Um, that people that are not coming to the office can get their device, whether it's a, a, a laptop, a mobile, a portal, 
uh, without you know coming uh, in the office, getting the the, the laptop, um, and doing this kind of stuff. So I think all this to me is really the basics, and and I think that. Uh, all the vendors have improved, even during the pandemics, um, all aspects of their solution to help companies to uh, to to get faster in, the, in this deployment. Um, to me, it's really about the cloud. You want people to reach out to SaaS applications. Um, you want people. You want to implement things like zero trust. You don't want to rely on the fact that somebody is part of a, 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 a network to give him access to something. You want to ensure that people that are working from home, from a Starbucks, from wherever, can access some data because they are who they are and because they, because they own a device that you trust. Um, you need to work on uh, what I was uh, describing for the, for the laptop, the zero touch config, uh, where people can basically even buy a laptop in, in, in a supermarket and be able to work for the company with this laptop. Laptop, But to me, this one are really the basics. Uh, and it's almost, I would say, the something that we already know. We know mm -hmm. uh, we probably need to do it better and so on, but that's something we know. There is all the other part, which is, to me, the, the, the uncharted area, OK? Mainly because, I mean, that's totally new. We are all working in the office, uh, and, and it was more or less working. Then we were forced to work, all of us, from home. And we learned how to do it. And now we need to learn how to work with some people in the office, some people at home. But when they are at home, perhaps they need to take care of the kids. Um, and they won't be available from 9 to 10, whatever. So we need to relearn all, all that stuff. We need to to basically change the way we are working from a way that was synchronous, uh, you know, like uh, starting a new project and everybody is in the same room, whether it's a, a virtual one or a physical one or several physical ones. We are all at the same place at the same time. We need to rework that into an asynchronous mode where you can work when it's the, the, the best moment for you to work. And you can consume content when it's the best moment for you to work. And that's uh, uh, something which is not, I would say, uh, um, not that easy to do. A lot of companies have already uh, done that. I remember for uh, perhaps in 2015 or already GitHub uh, explaining that everything was in the chat room. Even if people were in the same room, all the discussion were in the chat room. Why? Because then they can leave uh, to another country, uh, restart the laptop, and look at in the chat room what happened, and they mm -hmm. knew what was the, the what was happening. So to me, that's the, the really this part which is going, which is really bubbling this day. You can see a lot of new solutions that are coming, uh, a, a new solution that are also integrating IA to ensure not to make you more productive, but to check how you are feeling with the tool that we are giving to people. Um, are people happy to, to use this tool? Is it simple for them to use them? Um, uh, are they feeling nervous? You know, there, there are a lot of people that are feeling super nervous uh, being in a Zoom uh, meeting because everybody is basically looking at you at this moment when you are talking. You know, when you are in, in an office, when you are talking, people were looking at you. There, they can look at you even when you are not talking. So some people are nervous about that. And, and I think that, and again, that's part of the people stuff, but we need to take care of this part. And, uh, and you can see in a lot of the startups uh, that are emerging this day that you, you have much more of this uh, EQ uh, uh, part, which is coming in the, in, in the tooling. So the basics we know, uh, and there are a lot of super good uh, uh, resources to on how to implement uh, uh, all this stuff. All the other one we'll have to uh, to basically play and 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 test and try what's working, what not, what's not working. It, very interesting points you made there, Fred. So synchronous to asynchronous and not just uh, technology, but also the emotional quotient needed mm -hmm. to deal with all of this. Great. Uh, thank you for those points. Uh, Mune, I would like to come to you, right? So again, from a tech aspect, what are the uh, different things that you are seeing deployed and where is it headed? No, no, I think it's uh, 
as everybody's talked about this new hybrid model, right? I think we're all working towards this new, uh, you know, work where you can. But, you know, if you kind of wind the clock back, uh, you know, and say March or when the pandemic hit and everybody was like, oh, forced to work, like Fred said, back at home. Um, like he said, the base was, how do I get a, a digital workspace that's seamless so I can work from, you know, that is the, the foundation. Can I have the same workspace that I experience in, at work also at, at my home, which is a very you know, basic foundation required. But what's also happened from the back end infrastructure, if you just you kind know, of step back and look at it, because I saw this movie play out and us helping out, um, I know within a within five days of the pandemic hit and everybody asked to go home, we had 3,000 inbound inquiries from airlines, healthcare, education, everybody asking us for help to say, everybody, if you just step back and look at the infrastructure deployment, everybody has huge campuses. I think, you know, Facebook campus or Seattle, they have huge network pipe bandwidth that is mm -hmm. stuck pre, pre uh, you know, assigned, pre-configured for this pipeline which is God doing diddly squat right now. And then, you know, I live close to the VMware campus here in, in Palo Alto. And same thing, the home network is not that up to speed. So people were forced to suddenly think, how do I dynamically reconfigure my network capacity, which is now sitting idle in big campus locations and my home networks are getting stressed because I don't have enough capacity. So if you think about delivering that workspace experience in the back end, people had to start thinking creative about reconfiguring and you know dynamically changing around network capacity because now suddenly in my house, I got two daughters and my wife, four of us, kids are at school, all of them are running online sessions. It wasn't like you know nine to five where school at work, we come back and in the evening we're doing a bit of email. Now this is the primary home concern. So suddenly, Network capacity shifted from big campuses towards home networks. How do I redeploy capacity? Second, where we had everybody coming to a campus and a security posture. This could be firewalls, you know, all of that. We're very secure. Now you're exposed at the limit of a home security, which we you know you didn't think about too much. So how do I take security posture, move it towards the edge, towards the home? How do I take network capacity and redeploy it dynamically became a huge challenge, right? What we're delivering is still the workspace experience, but that workspace experience is going to suck if I don't have enough capacity. And that workspace experience is going to be compromised from an enterprise perspective if it's not secure. Because suddenly in my home network, I have access to all my corporate information that wasn't probably there in the past. So this, these were interesting challenges that we you know, went through to say, okay, and now most of the applications are you know, hairpinned back into a data center or back into a cloud. How do I start moving network services, security services, compute services, all closer to the edge for us to activate this? So we've seen in the last 15 months, this evolution change go from you know, everything centralized in, in a, you know, either in a data center or in a cloud model, go towards the edge, to provide network security, compute, a workspace, user experience, productivity towards the edge. And that's kind of uh, a massive investment shift. Now, yes, it's going to be in a hybrid model, but this capacity then has to be more dynamically provisioned rather than statically provisioned. So it's a massive change in uh, the back end technologies we got to invest into and how this you know, fluidly moves around away from static uh, provisioned environments. Interesting. Mune, I, I really liked how you described this. It was almost like a Netflix thriller, uh, especially on the moving the bandwidth and provisioning network in different areas and security posture. Thank you. I think those are some really, really good points. Uh, Dave, I would quickly like your take on, on the same question as well. Sure, absolutely. And it, it's interesting. Some companies found they, their pipes weren't being used. Other companies had backhauled all their traffic back to their corporate offices. And when everybody went home, it saturated the, the pipe. So we had to help people re-architect their networks and think about what should be 
brought through that pipe and what shouldn't be. Um, and Teams architecture, for example, you don't need to bring the media back called um, and run securely still at the same time, signaling and other things you might bring through. So it's important to really have the right architecture. The other thing is, is the right devices. All of our cameras in these meeting rooms and past for the 7.8% that do have video, it'd be one camera on the room and you get somebody sitting at the back of the room and they're this big and you can't see them. And now we've got intelligent cameras coming out. Logitech just released uh, or is in the process of releasing one. I was in a meeting earlier today and three people in the same room were on three different videos. It was like they each had their own camera, even though it was one camera at the front of the room that was using AI to split that into three separate videos. So they were looking like people on the call. It was very interesting and a different participation. The other thing that we're doing is we're enabling spatial audio. If we sit in a room together, I hear someone coming from here and I hear someone else coming from here and someone else dead center. For the last couple of years, everything's been center speaker. And that's not how we're used to digesting information as humans. We hear it coming from different places. Those signals help us. And now we're seeing intelligent speakers coming out. What's an intelligent speaker? It can recognize who's speaking, even if we're in the same room. And it can mm -hmm. start to put, so when I see a transcript of that meeting, I can see who spoke it even though they were in the same place. It's not like I know it's Sidon speaking when you speak because you're coming through one feed. No, we're all in the same room and the speaker can actually separate us and, and transcribe. So I think we're seeing more collaborative, more holistic solutions here. Um, we're also doing some new things with layouts. We're moving video so you can have it at the top or you can have it at the bottom. So you might have it across and then have projection up across everything. And now the people that are in the room are looking at people at eye level on that same screen as opposed to looking up to them and having a very different weird view of them. So we're starting to look at just the different ways people interact. And even finally, I have with me here a 19, I don't know what year it is, I'm gonna say 1970 whiteboard over here. You know, this is like low tech marker, eraser. Well, we've got these web content cameras. You take a Logitech Brio, point it at that, We'll de-skew it automatically. And when the person steps in front to write, we'll let you see through them so they're not blocking what's on the whiteboard. And now I can use that at home. I can use that in the office. And so now everybody can participate using state-of-the-art digital whiteboards like a Surface Hub or good old-fashioned, you know, staples staple <laughs> that, uh, that we're all used to using. So it's a combination of of bringing all of that into the workspace and then digitizing it. You can shoot a picture of that and then paste it into your digital whiteboard and edit everything as if you had originated it in the digital whiteboard as a pen stroke. Uh, it's very, very cool technology that's, and, and the coolest part is it disappears. The tech disappears when it's really good. You don't think about it. You just do what you're trying to do. Great, Dave. And if what Munay was saying was like a thriller, what you just, the story you portrayed was like a sci-fi movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just sticking to that, I will move to Claudia because she works on some of those uh, sci-fi technologies. Uh, Claudia, <laughs> what do you, where do you see uh, the future of augmented reality, virtual reality? We've been talking about that for a long time. In the context of uh, digital workplaces, where do you see it heading? Yeah, so I think it's interesting because I live kind of in both worlds, right? So Portal for us is a manifestation of a great communication device. And it does have some of those features that they was talking about, which is what kind of makes it magical in the in the example he gave of speaking to, I think it was his mom in Manitoba. Oh, so, yeah. you know, you feel like the screen disappears when you're speaking to your loved ones, you know, someone very far away because of that natural experience with, with the way the camera and the audio works on Portal. And but that's really just, in, in, in my opinion, it's important because it solves communication problems. How do we communicate with one another and stay close and connected as people when we're not in the same room in the same place, right? So communication is really important. But then you think about collaboration. And I think what I, what I see is that virtual reality is almost magical when it comes to collaboration. When you put a virtual reality headset on and you are in a meeting and you're actually doing something, you're designing a product, you're brainstorming, you're having a workshop and you feel physically present in that interaction, that's collaboration. Right. And, and, and it, as I said earlier, it has to be authentic. And in 2020, everyone sort of focused on collaboration as a use case. 
And I'm, I'm sort of here to say collaboration is not a use case, right? Every, everything that we do has to be collaborative, especially in this new world. And so in virtual reality, what we're seeing is in our ecosystem, I work with a lot of partners. And so we have some amazing companies, you may or may not have heard of them, uh, companies like Arthur and Spatial, who are reinventing, um, if you will, these collaboration experiences in virtual reality. They are thinking about collaboration as a, if you will, a feature within their experience, not necessarily the use case itself. So everything we do in all the immersive experiences has to be collaborative now, whether you're developing a training application to train people, whether you're um, improving a workflow, a 3D workflow, um, you know, you're designing a building and you're, you know, you're an architect or whether you're in a meeting and you are designing a product. Um, it doesn't matter. Everything sort of, ha you have to think about it, collaboration first. And that's what virtual reality is really making possible. And I think when, as we sort of look forward beyond that into augmented reality, you put the two together and you're really getting in this mixed reality world, um, you know, you, it, not even use cases, but experiences that we're not even thinking about right now that we don't believe is possible quite yet. Um, but they will be possible once we put these technologies together. Um, and, and I think we have to think about it beyond the, the use case itself and think about what is that experience? What are we trying to do to solve these problems that we didn't know we had two years ago? Perfect. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, uh, MB, quick take from your side on, on this point uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the virtual reality and mixed reality um, experience. Uh, you're on mute, MB. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so j just uh, extending uh, where uh, Claudia left. So uh, the first reason I think uh, we are seeing evolution in this technology is um, the users and the organizations are realizing the benefits of virtual reality and augmented reality for their use cases, right? Uh, that's the first reason. Earlier, uh, AR and VR were just uh, associated with say gaming or to some extent education, but not anymore. Like uh, the manufacturing industry or the retail industry, uh, all these industries are realizing that, hey, the same technology can be used for our use cases as well. And then comes uh, the application developers such as us, like say BlueJeans that has developed application for some of these devices. What we do is we, we leverage the capabilities of these devices and also the server side capabilities like the edge compute, like putting BlueJeans server at the edge, leveraging benefits of uh, low latency, high compute power to deliver same kind of experience even in this virtual environment where some of these devices don't have like great connectivity or the compute power, basically offloading the compute power to edge and still providing the immersive experience for the users. So some of these reasons, uh, like the contribution of the developer community or the application developers, and also evolution of these device capabilities are contributing uh, to this more, uh, most, more immersive uh, experience in the virtual uh, workspace world. Got it, got it. Uh, just one more uh, quick point and, and I'll, I'll get Fred uh, in on this one. Um, for, from, you know, just being secondary devices like we discussed to uh, more of the uh, new age collaboration, digital workplace kind of environments. Uh, and I think Dave also hinted on, you know, uh, you know, almost like unified communication platforms. Uh, so Fred, uh, what do you think makes for a very successful deployment of something like a unified communication platform? To me first, it's choosing the right tool. For your company, I mean, there is not only one. Uh, and even, uh, for example, in our case, we're not choosing only one because there are some edge cases, I would say, or some specific cases, but you, but you want to have this platform uh, and you want to, make, to have it simple. I mean, people, and that's uh, more or less the, what Dave was, was saying with the portal. We, we need to, to, have, to have a platform which is simple for people to use. Um, and then it's basically shifting, ensuring that uh, your leadership is actively using. This is what, what we have done. I mean, it, it was in between got easy with the pandemics because, I mean, <laughs> that, that you had no other way to, to really communicate with people. But still, what we have seen that we moved our leaders uh, uh, using Teams a lot, using live events. Uh, and this is basically what helped all the company to uh, uh, to have this view directly from from the, the the leadership and to interact with the leadership somehow uh, it makes them much more reachable 
Okay, so the moment you, you start having uh, your leadership using it actively, um, you are starting to draw people there. Because think about it, when you are in Zoom, everybody has the same uh, uh, square uh, video. You know, there is not this specific position on a table or, or, or something like that. We are almost all equal there. So it was something like people feel closer to, to the leadership. Uh, and there are also the things like Yammer, uh, uh, for example, that we are using that help us a lot on, the, uh, on this idea of moving from just discussing with people in an office or sending mails to something which was a little bit more asynchronous, a little bit more inclusive as well. Uh, and, and to me, that's, that's also what helped people. Um, we have a lot of different sites. Uh, but, you know, we were having from time to time this syndrome where you have meetings with a lot of people and you have 10 people in a room, two people on the video from home or from their, their uh, meeting room. And then the, the discussion starts happening between the 10 in the, 10 in the same room and you forgot people there. <laughs> when everybody is on Zoom or Teams, I mean, you, it's much more inclusive because right. you are hearing and then it makes that the 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 people that were in inside that were considered as remote uh, have the same uh, level or the, the same mm. saying as the other. Basically, we are removing the visibility uh, parts that we were having, each challenge that we are having into something where everybody can be visible and then you, are, you start more talking about the impact of people. So, to me, it's really, it's really showing the example and, and really having your leaders using actively to communicate this uh, this platform and people will start moving. Perfect. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, Dave, your quick comments on, on this part. Yes. So for um, a successful launch, I think it has to be more than just about what we're doing right now. It has to be the flow of work. I know several people have talked about people and process, and I think it's key to keep people in the flow of work. If all we've done is swapped email for an interactive chat, we've done little, we've done nothing. So for us, it's all about bringing that flow of work before the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting. How do we get things done together? As Claudia rightly said, collaboration is why we work together. Otherwise, we'd be all independent contractors and doing our own thing and working independently. So I think it's about helping people really get in the moment, get in the zone, stay in the flow of work. And for us, that means collaboration apps. It means apps in a meeting. It means fluid components that, that live beyond the meeting. I don't have to go hunting for anything. If I know we met and we were talking about something, it's all together as a unit. I, can, I have all that information there. So it becomes something I don't think about. I just think about the action that I went through, the outcome that I'm after. And now the tool is serving me as opposed to me having to think about which tool when and being overwhelmed by that. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Dave. Um, Munay, I will come to you uh, on one of the inter uh, pertinent questions around uh, the space. And you kind of hinted at this when in your in your previous reply uh, on the security portion of this, right? And, and uh, we all know uh, in the home environment, there's a lot more threat, etc. Uh, but what are some of the initiatives uh, that you have taken that companies are taking to ensure uh, this environment is a lot more secure uh, in, in terms of a digital workplace? No, I think it's, uh, you know, as we said, like, hey, reprovisioning network capacity, reprovisioning, you know, security to the edge. So, you know, from a you know, VMware perspective, you know, we've always obviously had different kind of technology components. Now we kind of brought to market anywhere workspace that first delivers on the workspace platform. But with that comes software-defined wide area network, SD-WAN. Mm -hmm. So you can actually do... Um, you know, you don't have to hairpin traffic if you're actually accessing SaaS applications from the cloud. You don't have to hairpin back into your data center and go back into the cloud. You can directly access cloud services from the home and, you know, drive efficiencies we've seen. So we brought the Anywhere Workspace solution, deliver workspace, but in the back end have software-defined wide area network to optimize network with, you know, um, uh, secure services at the edge, so SASE services from firewalls to, uh, you know, all of them at the edge with endpoint detection and response. So we, you know, from our carbon black portfolio, we deliver that for all types of machines, both, you know, be it PCs, mobile phones, laptops, all of them together. So we had to think through where we were able to do this for 
corporate locations, we had to then push them out to the edge to, you know, lay the foundation with, you know, our workspace solutions, which are pretty, you know, uh, you know, widely adopted, but not just, you know, deliver a workspace. How do we deliver on top of that workspace? you know, zero trust security? How do we give you know, optimized WAN connections? How do we provide cloud native endpoint protection for home you know, you know, machine? So delivering, you know, a secure distributed edge with uh, multimodal employee experiences and a fully mo- automated workspace, because it's not just about, you know, delivering this and, you know, going, oh, everything is going to work. You also need to manage this remotely because it's not just the employees are working remotely the it staff supporting them are also working remotely right um so you need to be able to provide full automation of deployment of those workspaces and experiences Mm -hmm. give a multimodal experience that is seamless and then have a, a very distributed architecture so everybody had to you know pivot the architecture to be very data center or cloud-based to be more distributed edge-based. And that with that came moving off assets, technology, security, compute, and all of those services closer and closer rather than being centralized in a cloud model or a, or a data center model. That kind of changed architecture because we all want to perform and give the best experience. Now, newer uh, use cases, like, you know, I think Claudia mentioned AR, VR, what are they generating? They're generating a lot of data. Where's that data going? The data needs to be processed in real time at the edge. They don't have time latency fabrics enough to be processed back somewhere. So they are all real time because, you know, if you have an AR, VR in a factory floor and a manufacturing environment and PR, people are doing this in real time and there is, God forbid, a couple of seconds delay, then they could be, you know, dropping pallets of uh, warehousing. So it has to be real time, not even in real, real time. So for all of that to be super effective and you have to think about how is then, you know, the entire energy moving towards the edge, which is uh, how do we, you know, rechange our architecture models to uh, be more distributed and, and, and real time. And that requires, and, and, you know, full zero trust, because again, we're not hiding behind data center protection firewalls or cloud-based firewalls, you actually have to have edge-based firewalls that are at the user level, at the endpoint level, at the site level. So, which is a, a very different framework uh, to what, you know, client server architectures or cloud native architectures are built for. And we call it uh, edge native solutions and edge native applications and the edge native architectures, which are fundamentally very distributed. So where you know the pendulum shoots in the you know in the industry from centralized compute mainframes to distributed compute client server architectures to public cloud centralized compute. Now we're back to the distributed architecture where everything. But every time the pendulum swings, there's more and more uh, more slow, you know compute capacity, security requirements, rigidity in, in that kind of model and this exponentially going. It's an interesting aspect. And I think as we come into this hybrid work environment, those new types of application and collaboration is just driving more data at the at the edge. And how do we get it processed in real time? Because if you're not, if it's super delayed, that experience will suck. <laughs> and nobody will adopt it. Everybody will be back in the office, right? Because it's just a, a poor, poor performing experience. And I think, you know, video conferencing has been there for maybe... Going to back to my research days, you know, I know AT and T from nineteen <laughs> seventies, uh, but the amount of adoption, I know Dave said it's very low, but definitely there was a hockey stick through this pandemic, right? There was there was no necessity; it was just a nice to have. Now it become a necessity, and I think that's really what's driving the adoption rates. And I think we need to have the the architectures, the infrastructure, the security posture, the connectivity in order to pull it off. Because if that goes down, then you're back in the office. <laughs> great, thank, thank, great, thank you, Munay. Uh, I think we just have a couple of minutes left. So I'll, I'll kind of uh, modify a little. I want to bring in, uh, we'd had some really good questions from the audience. I want to pick one of them, uh, which is actually very pertinent to, to the discussion. And I would like to get Claudia's uh, opinion on this. Uh, so there a lot of times the uh, you know the employee feels that there are a lot of these technologies etc but uh, do how do how do how does somebody humanize these technologies right how do we make it a lot more um, uh, 
person first and technology second per se uh, and i i know you have been doing some brilliant work on this claudia so i would want you to share your perspective uh, with the audience on this one and then after that i'll just come to rishi and i'll try and close this yeah so i think you know i spoke about it touched about it a little bit throughout our our discussion i think it really is important to think about the authenticity of the experiences putting people first and i think dave was responding to one of the chat uh, questions and and kind of hit the nail on the head you have to design with this in mind like everything has to be um designed with people first people centric human centric experiences we our expression of that is thinking about the, developing this true sense of presence right and so you know when we launched portal we talked a lot about the feeling of being there in the same room with your loved ones even when you're not and it's it's true in the work environment we've spent a lot of time talking about this idea of like notion of everyone should feel equally present right and equally sort of um connected as they're communicating collaborating regardless of where they are and you know clearly there's a lot of of complexity in in solving these problems and making this experience real but i think it starts with designing the experience the thinking about the technology from that people first that sense of presence um as a principle as a guiding principle and one of my roles is to be able to um actually advocate for this with our ecosystem. So it's not, you know, obviously the ecosystem is really key here. It's not about just the technology we design, the products we deliver. It's truly about these experiences that are created by the application developers that are are bringing to life this vision and they're I believe that right now they're more important than ever to solving this problem and and making it real. Perfect. Thank you, Claudia. I know we are a little over. I'll just uh, take my last question, uh, Rishi. I would like to bring you in, and and you you can. Uh, that would be uh, the uh, the last one that we take. Um, we we've talked about different things that enterprises are trying to do in terms of best practices, uh, and also how they are trying to reimagine the future. And there are many questions that enterprises need to ask themselves, especially now that you know it's moving from completely. Uh, home to hybrid to somewhere in the middle on the office side um where do you think uh, or what are the biggest questions that companies need to answer as they move forward and reimagining this entire work model maybe almost like all over again so so a few aspects you know which we need to take care of uh, you know whatever strategies which we are making you know is this uh, you know accepted or coming from the employees do do we have buy ins in place you know uh, uh, before we uh, implement any kind of strategy right so what i what i look forward is you know there should be more polling applications survey applications basically which would be specifically for the enterprises which would be brought into the picture you know so that uh, you know simple surveys joint decision making inclusive decision making can be brought onto the table number one number second when we talk about transitions are we ready for it right culturally as well as infrastructurally you know those are the things uh, organization needs to decide you know uh, how they are going to strategize these these aspects in coming future you know so we need to take care of the the stress which employees or uh, you know are already going through or they might be going through when they will be working in this kind of environment you know so all those aspects needs to be brought onto the table sentimental analysis related aspects needs to be taken care of you know we will have to use lot of uh, uh, you know ai enabled decision making in the enterprise environment so that you know these these kind of things can be uh, you know looked upon from a greater detail and uh, you know right kind of strategies could could be made uh, for for the employees and uh, for the uh, for the enterprises as well got it perfect uh great i think uh, i've i've been getting a lot of nudges from my from my team uh, so great i think this has been a really really exciting panel we touched everything from technology uh to human behavior to corporate ethics and human values uh, i think this has been one of the most enriching uh, one and a half hours in a very long time that i have spent uh, i know we could have just gone on and i i still regret not coming to some of you for a few of the interesting questions that we had planned i'm sure we can we can interact uh, uh, again on different platforms and i hope the audience uh, has had a 
uh, enriching experience just as I did. Uh, so I just hand it back to Jamila to take this over and then close the session.